We are here today to basically talk about the practicalities of 5G deployment. I've already said that you really got to be working on it right now and you're probably going to be working on 4G or the continuing evolution of LTE Advanced Pro because that's fundamentally the foundation of 5G and it could actually be 5G. Uh, it just doesn't have the radio part portions of it set yet. So <clears throat> this is kind of where we go into the fact that uh, you got to ask yourself the question is, is R&D on 5G or in this particular case maybe 4.9G, is it money in the bank? The reason I say that is because if, if you, it's so complex and there's so much to do and so much that has to be done that if you're not doing some rather extensive R&D right now, uh, you're missing the boat. At the same time, 4.9G uh, is actually the lowest risk and fast, fastest path to a healthy return on investment. This is important for us as developers because obviously our, pro our projects, our products are all funded based upon uh, their revenue producing potential. So even though uh, 5G isn't necessarily clear, um, you certainly doesn't stop you from working on it right now. To go along with this, when you hear all the uh, major OEMs who are really kind of the experts in the industry, there's a couple of dominant players there, they are already saying that the equipment that they are shipping is 5G ready. So um, because of my background as far as digging deep into uh, the teardown of uh, uh, baseband, uh, base transceiver stations, BTS, or BBU, baseband unit, or the whole RAN, um, I kind of understand uh, got to a point where I really understand stood the architecture very very well and I was able to focus on that front hall uh, or the optical networking which is co of course a theme of the, uh, this particular track um, what it the vendors mean when they say their hardware is 5G ready is that everything's already there the pieces are already there that they can roll out 5G if and when you know, they decide that they can start promoting it that way. Uh, even if the, the uh, radio waveforms and other things aren't necessarily settled yet. So, as far as for this group, um, how many of you here are involved in either the networking side or the optical networking side? If I could see a show of hands real quick. Okay, for sure, a couple. Okay, that's actually where uh, the heavy, heaviest, heavy duty uh, design activities uh, happening is anything that's sort of involved in that sort of front hall network or mid hall as they call it and this actually includes other radio systems Wi-Fi, um, Y-Gig, uh, any kind of YLAN, any kind of wireless connectivity is going to play a really important part in this. Uh, the interface that's going to tie it all together um, Everybody thought that it would just be Ethernet and that Ethernet would replace CIPRI, the current common public radio interface. Everybody just calls it by the initial CPRI or CIPRI. Um, everybody saw, sort of thought uh, CIPRI is dead. It's going to get replaced by Ethernet. Well, I'm here to tell you today that that is definitely not the case. Uh, CIPRI is here to stay. They just put an E in front of it and make it Ethernet CIPRI and they're good to go. Uh, and just to show you how uh, dramatic of a opportunity that that is, um, they just had the recent IEEE face-to-face -face meetings in, um, in Beijing and one of the key demos that was given there uh, actually demoed eCIPRI and not their own uh, P1914.3 or radio over Ethernet. So that basically tells you, okay, this this thing called eCIPRI is ready for prime time already, even though we won't get to see the uh, specification until uh, this coming August. Um, who knows, maybe there's going to be a little pressure for them to uh, release that early, seeing how it's, uh, it's out there and being demoed. This brings us to the question as far as is 
are we facing with 5G a transport evolution? In other words, it's just a follow-on to uh, the 3G, 2G, 3G, and 4G type systems that we've had in the past? Uh, or is it going to be something revolutionary because they are kind of looking at things different? In this particular case, I'm in the camp to say that it is going to be revolutionary because what they're t calling and talking about as far as 5G crosshaul, this great new uh, idea as far as crosshaul, is actually something that is and can be implemented uh, for 4G LTE Advanced Pro. So uh, for those of you that have heard or for those of you that will try and tell you that crosshaul is just for 5G, uh, you know that that's not the case uh, right now. So where crosshaul's really big play is, is the fact that how do you connect all these small cells and Wi-Fi and other sort of radios that want to closely work with your uh, radio and your uh, <coughs> smartphone? Uh, well, the answer is, is that it's, it's something that's done with some, uh, something called uh, mid-haul. Mid-haul is effectively carrier ethernet. So as far as cross-haul, what cross-haul does is from what I can absorb from all the standards and all the technical, greatest technical information, is that it basically is the everything front-haul in that it absorbs this mid-haul to sort of be able to closely coordinate between uh, small cells between Wi-Fi nodes, between Wi-Fi and LTE, uh, LTE and small cell. Um, basically, this is the, they have to have a path, an optical path, no, no less, uh, to handle all that uh, coordination messaging. And so um, uh, the bottom line is, is that this eCIPRI protocol that is part of the front hall more than likely can accommodate other plane Ethernet traffic instead of its CIPRI protocol uh, packets or mapping, and it can uh, uh, do this uh, mid-haul or X2, XN, or XW uh, type configuration. Um, so, uh, bottom line is is that uh, it's coming, it's here, it's not necessarily 5G. You don't have to wait for 5G to jump on that bandwagon. It's here today. At the same time, and one of the reasons that got me so interested in, in front hall per se, that, opti that huge optical network that's going to be between the uh, baseband processing units and the software defined radio uh, that's done in digital, uh, is this sort of legacy CIPRI requirements. And uh, basically, it sets some very tight uh, latency facing, timing, and other relationships as far as what CIPRI has to meet to be able to do this. That doesn't change for 5G, and in fact, it even gets tighter. Um, they're talking about reducing the latency so it can do real-time type applications, um, all kinds of other interesting stuff like that. So that's kind of where that's go going to come from. Um, not to necessarily dwell on the subject, but you got to ask yourself what other, su what other surprises are coming with 5G. Uh, you know, Gender has touched on the fact that Google and Facebook and others are working on some really interesting stuff. Well, um, it doesn't necessarily end uh, as far as just with them. It's also the Cisco's and networking folks are working on something uh, called CORD, which is basically central office re-architected as a data center. That's CORD. They add an M in front of it for mobile, and therefore this, this whole concept of M CORD is a very important and uh, useful uh, type of uh, next generation network configuration. Now this is kind of where you have commodity x86 servers serving as uh, a, a kind of virtualized uh, BBU or baseband unit 
And of course, you know all the big networking players are really in that space to define what is cord, what is it going to do, that sort of thing. Um, for sure, it's going to be uh, uh, software-defined networking and virtualized uh, network virtualized functions, uh, commonly known as uh, SDN, uh, NVF for those people uh, outside of the networking space. Uh, it's, it is definitely going to happen. It's just a matter of when does it get uh, reach co uh, commercial, very profitable volumes. And that's really the, the billion dollar question that needs to be asked as far as uh, 5G. Uh, I'm of the opinion that it's going to be a little later than everybody would want it to be because uh, they have to do it right, do it right the first time. Um, therefore, there's a lot of gaps as far as that are in uh, 5G or certainly the gaps between uh, the path from 4G to, to 5G. And one of the things that I really like to uh, sort of throw out there is this whole concept of HAPS over LA. Um, that's a drawing. I'll, I'll close with that particular drawing. And so I'll, I'll sort of keep uh, exactly what it is uh, a little bit of a secret. But that's actually something we could see uh, uh, out there within four or five years. So uh, again, I had mentioned the fact to the people that were here earlier that today's conversations and co conversations and participation or direct one-on-one -on -one conversations with you guys as developers doesn't necessarily end here or uh, have to be something that you know we talk about here. It's, it's actually something that's going to continue on a new collaboration platform that is fully secure and encrypted and suitable for the kind of private one-on-one -on -one developer conversations of the topics that we are involved in uh, and everyday, uh, everyday work. Uh, this isn't something you'd want to put out an email or share an email. I don't know how many of you guys know, know about this. This is re actually relates to what we're doing here. Um, but email goes out on the backbone in plain text. Um, it Header information, time, what it is, uh, what attachments and everything else, that's all in plain text and anybody can basically scoop that and get a lot of useful information or it has attachments that are encrypted. Uh, they still can, somebody can get, grab some really good information there. The reason that's so important for this transition between 4.5G and, and 5G is that that uh, security vulnerability has to be addressed and has to be closed. The good news is, is that last week, um, uh, an Australian company, Telstra, did a active demonstration of a 10 gig fiber optic, fully encrypted fiber optic network from Melbourne to LA and successfully met all the requirements, uh, you know, having fully encrypted uh, data on there. What's notable about that is they're, they're ready to actually do the same thing at 100 gig. So, uh, Raghu, I'll, I'll invite him up here and, oh, yeah, you. you can just go ahead and come up here. I uh, jumped in line. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to potentially surprise Rag Raghu and let him go on or let Goba to introduce him and we'll come back to the next slide after this seeing how I've thoroughly uh, talked uh, about this particular slide. Uh, how's that for, uh, for a boot camp? Uh, we're, we're throwing an awful lot of really good information at you if, uh, if you hadn't recognized that uh, but I think so far uh, we're about halfway through so uh, it will definitely get a little more intense here. That said, what is the challenge? The challenge is, is the fact that here in the United States, when you measure and compare our LTE download speeds with the rest of the world, we're down here at the bottom of the list. We're at the bottom of the list here. Uh, I didn't have permission to, to use this slide, uh, so it actually, uh, actually, okay. 
it should it'll, it should be clear, and uh, I can get you one that's uh, that's easily readable. The bottom line is, is that we're really behind behind the rest of the world. A lot of this can be potentially traced to the fact that we don't have really any government help per se. We have all kinds of nice national uh, IT and uh, different groups like that. So the question from there is, is uh, are they doing enough? So um, somehow this, okay, this got, this got changed. Okay, uh, this is actually the, uh, <coughs> Okay, somehow I picked up uh, the, uh, an older version of this. Uh, let's see. Okay, that might have been my, my mistake. Okay, so anyway, you can really realize how, much, how far behind you, we, we are um, on this slide, and I apologize that I'm not presenting it. Basically, it says that the U.S. started out in 2005 pretty good shape. They at least spent 8% of their telecom revenue on R&D. But then from 2008, it dropped off to almost nothing. We are in the same group as China when you compare our R&D spending to both Japan, which is averages around $4 billion a year, and Europe, that for 10 years, they've been over $6 billion R&D. Um, and uh, in seven of 11 years. So bottom line is, is that we're now in a situation where the U.S. is going to spend a lot more money on R&D. It's going to happen this year. You're going to want to get on that, uh, get on that train or whatever. Um, so now we go real quickly to the th what I call the three R's of 4.9 to 5G. And that is uh, the R&D, which we just covered and there's going to be some great improvements there. And the next one is risk. I think you've seen evidence of some really uh, powerful new things and technology coming. Uh, with that comes uh, some incredible amount of complexity and uh, along with that complexity comes really some risk that schedules aren't going to be met that something's not going to get be right the first time. So risk now becomes, for a lot of these 5G uh, uh, features, becomes the highest things that, as developers, we have to watch out for. This means that if uh, your marketing department comes at you with a, an aggressive schedule, you need to just tell them, you know, go back and come up with a different plan because uh, we can't take that risk. However, there is a, there is a solution to uh, sifting through that risk and that is basically to participate in the developer community where you can get fast answers to the details and the information that you you need the most. Third is return on investment, ROI. Everybody's talking about 5G as if it's going to be here in 2020 and that somehow that's going to be magically uh, everybody's going to shift to it. The reality is is there's probably going to be a 2% or 1% of, they're going to be lucky if they get 1% or 2% of revenues uh, by 2022. Um, so this sort of leads us to the, my conclusion that 5G in everyday terms, and more importantly to the developer, isn't going to be something that is uh, it's going to happen until probably 2024, 2023 is a, a date that I use. So. This, in your, in your slide deck, you'll get a couple of references as far as where a lot of this R&D funding is going to come from. One company to, that's very dear to sort of all the world's embedded uh, developers, embedded designers, is the fact that SoftBank has now acquired Arm Holdings and now managed that entire thing. At the same time, they're, they've committed $50 billion for this year for Sprint R&D. At the same time, we're going to have a lot of companies bringing back uh, 
repatriating uh, foreign earnings. Uh, that's going to happen this year. Uh, and with any luck at all, uh, U.S. government gets a little smarter than they already are. At least they're talking of specifically about 5G and enabling IoT as far as with this. Let's not ignore this because through this we're going to actually, we, we have to participate in this process and uh, or else we're going to get left behind or might not get what we need as developers, uh, uh, not only here but worldwide. So this is uh, basically tells you a little more about uh, uh, network and information technology research and development program. This has been going on for a, a long time. However, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what is, is <coughs> funded or what goes into R&D funding in Europe. So uh, I certainly notice this and say that now's the time for us to get involved. End of the day, you guys have to develop products that you can ship, ship and ship for profit. So that's kind of where everything comes together. You know, you have this new 5G that's incredibly complex in its built-out configuration. Um, so basically what I'm telling you here today is, is, is don't wait to develop that fully developed 5G. <coughs> Jump in the water of 4G or LTE Advanced Pro and start developing now because that's really going to be the foundation of 5G. Um, and you... you you really got to get into it and start learning it now because the complexity is, is so great. At the same time, what brought us together as far as and, and brought you here for this uh, uh, tutorial was the fact that deeper analysis and community engagement and really sort of sharing information that we have is a really good way to sort of uh, figure out what it is you need to do and so that you can execute on your own development plans in a more efficient way. Um, alternative practices and studies uncover the telecom industry's kind of secrets or norms. This is stuff, if you try and get a data sheet on a ASIC inside a uh, OEM's uh, box, uh, fat chance, there, there's no description at all. In fact, the, the thing is pretty much sealed and out of your out of your reach. But there are ways to get in there. Uh, that's kind of what I've done for the last two and a half years and what brought me to uh, uh, Gobad and his company. <coughs> From what we learned, we're saying that, hey, if the rest of the developer community has access to this, and they can through Brax.me, um, they're going to benefit. Their development teams you know, around the world are going to benefit from this in information. So this is the fact that uh, reverse engineering accelerates R&D product development, product development analysis. You know kind of what the architecture should be, what yours will be, how it will compare. More importantly, you'll understand how you really need to uh, change your frame of mind from sort of a networking, networking infrastructure mindset to a mobile, mobile infrastructure mindset where the complexities, risks, and test cases, and all kinds of things that come with that, are a, a lot more involved and require a lot more expertise. So um, avoid the costly mistakes. Get your product designed right the first time. Get in there and really study 4G, because that's really where all the secrets are. This is a slide that I dropped in here because it sort of summarizes first in a, um, a thesis statement from an R&D project in Europe. And what they've looked at is basically, this is a 2014 thing, and they looked at all the automotive electronics and all the plans for what they was going to happen in, in an automotive. Uh, you can't look at a 5G slide deck today without seeing, uh, hey, IoT, uh, uh, driverless cars, you know, automotive is going to be a, a really big part of uh, 5G, and it will. Uh, the bottom line is, is that when you try and bring this uh, automotive world into and cover it in any kind of efficient way, it carries with it an awful lot of complexity bag baggage. 
So just be aware of that. That's another reason <coughs> to kind of get involved early to say, hey, I'm going to do this new 5G products. Uh, what, what should I be setting as my design goals? But more importantly, what is my test and validation? What, what am I going to do to make sure uh, you know, all my products, my PCBs, my chips, everything else uh, are really suitable for 5G use? And the answer is you're going to have to do a lot more than you're doing today. Therefore, the 5G design challenge is kind of cost-related risk and return on invest investment. This is kind of where the uh, community is going to come up and it's going to address the issues of cost. Cost being the number one and, and really serious type of issue here. Because end of end of the day, when you get ready to sell a product, you're going to be selling it into a very price competitive market. It's got to be the right price, the right cost, uh, everything else there. So this gets us into the column here in the green is the what favors incumbent OEMs and LTE advanced pro uh, type solutions. Who? Uh, mobile network operators and sort of a new flip on mobile network operators is the multi-vendor network operator or MV, uh, uh, MVNO and uh, this is kind of how uh, Raghu mentioned as far as that everybody's going to be competing to this deliver this bandwidth bandwidth in the home uh, you're going to have the uh, your television vendor coming in you're going to have your uh, internet service provider coming in you're going to have uh, you know the media channels everybody's going to sort of be competing to deliver you that content and the content promised by 5G and therefore it's going to expand dramatically so what this means is, is that your profits are going to be in 2020 and maybe even as long as four, five, seven years as long. You heard the, the comment about the radios are typically good for 10 years or something like that. Well, LTE in, in my neighborhood uh, just, just came available in 2016. So if I, if I do apply that 10 year rule there, and everything else that takes us to the middle of you know 2025 2026 so uh, population dense areas are going to get the priority there's going to be where you're going to have the 5g uh, trials and the first deployment of 5g because the numbers uh, allow that particular environment to uh, take a product that is over uh, what would otherwise be totally overpriced and then unsuitable. So we're going to see 5G by 2020. It's just what is it going to be and how involved it's going to be. Uh, existing mobile network infrastructure changes really slow. It's really tough. If you look at um, uh, numbers today, uh, Ericsson just announced their, their uh, profits being down again and everything else. And that's because uh, mobile network operators around the world aren't spending money on hardware just yet they're starting and they have a lot of equipment that they have pre-positioned uh, specifically there was a ton of Ericsson equipment that went into India and um, that equipment is publicly stated as being 5G ready which says hey they got a heck of a, a head start if and when the market uh, starts the network operators start buying their equipment. So, uh, some of the new vertical markets you, you, you've heard about today are really sound, really, really good, but at the same time, they're unproven. Uh, and what kind of cost would people, or, or what kind of uh, money will people pay for those kind of services? That's all unproven. And therefore, uh, you know, it's kind of goes to supporting the fact that. Uh, uh, on my paper that I'm going to give tomorrow that uh, 5G isn't necessarily, as they're billing it, going to be practical from, from, from a de developer perspective. Okay, I'm going to skip over this slide for a large degree, but it, you have it on your handouts. And basically, this, is, this has been me the last uh, two and a half, three years, is that I've done uh, <coughs> projects where I do some deep dive analysis of the radio system architecture. Um, more, more importantly, 
the, the E node B, evolve, evolve node B, um, what it has from an architectural standpoint, what it has from an oper, uh, operational and software perspective. Uh, this whole system is designed to take a top to bottom software upgrade every six months. So if you're an AT&T or you're a Sprint or you're a T-Mobile, you're going you're gonna to test the heck out of that software. You're going to have a pipeline process set up where you're testing the heck out of that next one because you cannot afford to deploy something uh, that uh, also deploys uh, holes, risks, or <clears throat> heaven forbid, a, a weak link that takes the whole network down. I don't know if any of you guys follow the uh, network operators around the world, but uh, it happened to the network operator in Australia where they had one of these weak network links that took down their system for days, cost them millions, millions and millions. So that's kind of where I get into the gory detail that sort of touches on your guys' area. I look at the, the PCBs, I look at the sub-modules, I look at the ASICs, I look at the other things, that, at the embedded subsystems that go into this. And when I apply it to the bigger picture and everything else, it allows me to have a really good understanding of the architecture. So, um, biggest change I've already said will be in the mobile optical subsystems. That's where a lot of neat stuff is, is coming from. Anybody here from Cisco? Okay. Speculation has it. I saw it in writing. Sort of backs up what I thought. Uh, speculation has it that Cisco will make some sort of bid and or purchase Ericsson. So from my perspective and what I've seen, it's, it's a must-do deal. They're going to have to do that as far as if they really want to stick around and play in this whole mobile optical network. Because uh, it'll, it'll, that, when that deal happens, it'll be the steal of the century. So that sort of gets you down into other gory detail that uh, isn't necessarily suitable here. I'm going to go through these slides kind of fast. But they sort of lay out the, the architectural and the design challenges in the uh, radio system architecture and specifically how it transitions from its current 4G LTE Advanced Pro to 5G and nothing has happened hardware-wise. You just put new software on it and you can, you can call today's 4G equipment that is uh, being sold and deployed gets to be called 5G. Same thing here, there are some uh, critical elements in here that you've got to know about, S split control and data planes, some other things that are going in here. When you look at, okay, who are, has uh, eNode V expertise, there are actually a fairly small list of the top ten, and these are some of them. And Guess what? Uh, the one U.S. company that was there, uh, Al Alcatel Lucent, is now Nokia. Uh, that's ALU. So let's just say that there's uh, a, a, a lot of interesting uh, uh, things to, uh, uh, to catch up with. Uh, that little subsonar sound is incredibly interesting or appropriate. These guys have come, come to recognize it, perhaps, if they have their notifications turned on for the Braxme community. It's basically an indication that somebody posted something in one of our rooms and, and that I can go look at it or whatever. I'm not going to bore you guys and take a look at it now, but I just did have to explain that uh, noise. It wasn't someone trying to eavesdrop on us or do something else. So we've gone over today the continuing evolution of advanced LTE Advanced Pro. You guys have heard that enough. There's a lot of new things coming, new radios, all kinds of neat stuff that's going to pull it all together. The biggest opportunity for Silicon Valley companies is right down here in this corner, and it has to do when we start adding Wi-Fi, YLAN, YGIG, other radios basically into this architecture and closely couple the transmission of data so that when you do have your cell phone and everything else, it delivers the, you the content you want when you want it 
And as a consumer, you don't need to worry about, well, is it Wi-Fi or is it using this new 28 gigs wide gig? They don't give, give up flying whatever. Uh, they don't care what it is. They just want the data and, and want it now type of thing. So that's really how uh, companies around here uh, get into right away and sort of how they're going to evolve and fit into the uh, 5G uh, biosphere or sphere of uh, kind of like everything. So uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, five, ten minutes. Okay. Um, so this kind of gets you back into and continues pounding on that message as far as LTE is the, the target. Uh, that's becoming pretty obvious. Uh, what isn't obvious is all the details why. This is a slide from Ericsson from 20, 2014. And that's where they have officially stated, not necessarily that they would still say this, but LTE uh, should be evolved as far as possible. Does anybody want to sort of hazard a guess at, at where your, your cell phone, what, what level of uh, 4G it has right now? Anybody want to throw out something? I, I happen to use, you know, 4G, 4, 4 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4 and the countdown to 5.0. Believe it or not, the phone that you have today is probably at uh, 4.6G as far as what it has. What that means is, you know, there's an awful lot of extra mileage that is going to be squeezed out of 4G. And that's why we, as a group, emphasize the fact that, hey, there's a lot of design activity right now that you guys should be doing. And if, and if your company or your product team or something else isn't excited about 5G, 4.9G, uh, they need to be. This is kind of other stuff talking about the RANs, other good technical stuff. You guys can go back and if you have any questions on any of these slides or whatever, well, uh, send uh, GoBot or us an email. We'll invite you into the BRAX community, add you in. Uh, what's really neat about Brax is that you get to be totally anonymous. You give us your email address, we sign you up, you get on, you delete your email. And with the right handle or name, I, I happen to be E to E uh, 5GT is my handle. Um, you're totally anonymous, so you can participate in all these nice developer networks without anybody knowing who you are, who you work for, uh, what your interests are. You, you just get, to get the information you need. Um, this is really big in the network world. If you're, if you're a Cisco or a Juniper or any one of the companies that participate in sort of the wired networking side of things, central office re-architected as a data center, that is fundamentally the transformation of the data uh, data center and central office. It's kind of bringing the mobile and the network stuff and sort of squeezing it together. And the fact that they call that 5G is kind of interesting because you know you wouldn't think that, that all that would be 5G technology and would fall under the 5G umbrella, but it does. So this is kind of where the scope for 5G has just mushroomed uh, incredibly and has challenged all of us up here as far as well how do we explain this and explain this correctly to uh, to our customers to the developer community worldwide so this just shows you as far as where the group of companies are in in how they practice their their hardware this black box is proprietary traditional on proprietary hardware this is where Cisco and others along with Ericsson, Huawei, NEC, and Nokia, that's kind of where they, they align very nicely. Now, why that's important and why these four companies are important, there are only four publishers now for the CIPRI.info <coughs> specification, and it's these four. The fact that we're already seeing eCIPRI demonstrations and everything else uh, says that something really good is in this in this next release of their specification that will come out in August. So there's a lot of 
Great stuff in here about x86 server, commodity server folks. This includes anybody doing storage, anybody doing other things. Um, kind of anything that plugs into the data center and everything else is going to be caught under this umbrella. Um, we haven't really talked much about mobile edge computing. That's going to be a huge thing. That's kind of these mobile edge servicers. Some of those new 5G-ish type things require this as far as for real-time response. And so it comes into the picture uh, in, a, in a big, big way. What a lot of people don't realize is you don't have to wait for 5G to actually do this and get this and get an ultra-low latency system. You can do it now. So this is taking a open cord drawing and sort of showing you how everything fits in. Um, something uh, hardly nobody in the industry, telecom industry, knows about uh, in everything else is this little piece of equipment right here and what it does. Well, the reason it is uh, such an important uh, sort of linchpin or key is the fact that it's based upon uh, reconfigurable FPGA technology so that it, right now, this is, this is built as a 16-port SIPRI MUX slash bridge slash switch. It could be a router. It could be anything. It is designed so that it can have flexible protocols. So it's been tailor-made for eSIPRI and whatever ever comes after that. You can do um, time-sensitive networking and everything else. Um, do we have any sports fans here? Any basketball fans? No, Warrior fans. Shucks. The last couple of games have been absolutely terrible. And, you know, all kinds of uh, artifacting and, and, you know, an unusable pitcher. Guess what? The time-sensitive network that they traditionally use broke down that day. And so it couldn't deliver the video in time, couldn't deliver the sound in time. And so that's kind of how uh, our everyday lives are affected by that. So uh, I won't go into these. You see that latency goes down. This is kind of another thing that if Cisco and Juniper is watching it, they need to. And this is where this whole concept of 5G crosshaul isn't restricted to 5G. It's something that you can actually configure and use today. So that's kind of tells you, you know, hey, don't wait for 5G, get on it now. This is a picture of those particular equipment. I happen to use Ericsson in this particular demonstration, but it could just as well be Nokia um, you know, or Huawei or ZTE or Samsung or a number of other different vendors have equipment that are in this arena. They just haven't done really well worldwide sales-wise yet. Um, Ericsson had been at the top. Uh, it, who knows where they're going to be as far as when this current transition to pre-5G uh, when it shakes out. I had mentioned the mid-hall being where all this action happens. And there's a lot of different technical terms. But one of the important things that Raghu mentioned was that this X2 interface is really important because it can go straight from E no B, E no B, small cell to small cell, Wi-Fi access point to Wi-Fi access point and can make them all play together nicely, hand over everything else. That's kind of the secret sauce that not a lot of people know about or, or look at. And it is going to happen and happen in a big way. So when we get, get back to that, that mid-haul, instead of being a <clears throat> add-on where it's a, the X1 is here and you attach all your Wi-Fi stuff here, and so it has this, this shortcut channel. Well, that's where uh, you function in here as far as in the multi-layer switch. And uh, hardly nobody knows that that can already be uh, configured and maybe even operational today. So this is, yeah, this is the just uh, mobile front hall networks that are really important. Uh, this just gives you that that one. Everybody that wants to talk about open standards and rah, 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 open standards, guess what? It's a no-op. Uh, the whole CIPRI uh, 
they attempted to open up and or define CIPRI in such a way that it would be an open standard. And it was uh, under the Etsy program called um, the uh, ORI. Uh, the bottom line is, is that it never, it never uh, reached critical mass. It never had the key OEMs participating in this. It was always the small cell people, the other people, the people that wanted to get into this network and couldn't. This tells you about the Argus 2017 release. This tells you kind of what's defined in one line in the press release is that this new standard that's coming out in August is going to define, it's, it, it says a split as in singular saying that the eCIPRI e has one split. It may not necessarily be that way. The bottom line is, is where you break this off and this, this stuff goes in the radio and this stuff goes in the virtualized BBU. It's very, very important because it can turn a uh, x86 server in the uh, MCORD uh, facility. It can make it happen really important because the really heavy duty processing is done in the radio head. And guess what? This radio head doesn't even have to be, uh, it can be integrated as part of the antenna. And so that's a really important thing as far as with this. Uh, if you have any questions on these other slides, this just goes over and shows you. Uh, uh, I kind of explain here why I'm right. Uh, and, you know, well, I can give you concrete facts and information that you can take to your boss and say, hey boss, we need to do something else. So, uh, this tells you about the baseband units. These are a couple of new uh, radios that Ericsson and Nokia are selling. It uses the terminology AIR, AIR scale, Ericsson AIR. AIR stands for Antenna Integrated Radio Products. Basically you have something hanging out there on the cell phone tower and it does everything including a lot of the heavy duty lifting that makes the virtualized BBU possible. Uh, it sort of enables that portion of it. Um, this is something that they might already be shipping equipment that all it needs is a software upgrade to deliver uh, 5G like performance and capabilities. There's a lot of complexity here. You heard a little bit of, a, of them in our talk today. This is a Nokia configuration as far as how you plug their existing flexi modules combine it with their new radio head, their air product, air scale product. This becomes an air scale system. And guess what? It talks to and incorporates all kinds of neat stuff in the middle. Small cell, Wi-Fi, wide gig, 28 gigahertz. This is basically stuff that can happen today. It doesn't have to wait for 5G. So I make the points there as far as that. Okay, this is the fun part where I sort of say, uh, M chord gaps and haps. Um, I'm predicting that the gaps, the stuff that companies don't know, uh, are really going to come back and bite them if they don't look at it right now. So uh, that's important. You fill in the gaps, you can have a better chance to make more money uh, in your products within the next year or so, two years. <coughs> um, then we go into as far as disruptive technology. That's where this HAPS, HAPS over LA comes into play. It's a high altitude platform station. And when you just look at or think of the idea, you say, oh, well, this is way off in the future. No, this is something that can fly today. This is, this is some of the stuff behind the neat stuff that, that Google and Facebook and some of the other companies are, are playing around with. They're already working on a persistent aerial station technology. This is where you have a bird up there flying at 65,000 feet and it delivers high bandwidth Wi-Fi to your car as it's going down the freeway at um, 280 kilometers an hour, something like that. So anyway, that's kind of how they're going to deliver that kind of stuff there. So this just gives you an idea of what is near space. You have it in the download section that you can look at. It's got a timer on it. Okay, I'm, or he's pushing the button. No. Anyway, this sort of shows you that a, a persistent platform high above the Central Valley
can basically deliver high-speed uh, internet connectivity to any car, any train, any delivery. This is the big thing on 5G. This isn't happening uh, in the future. It's happening now. You can start doing some of this. So option one is something that they can basically beam into your car, car and that sort of thing. They don't need a lot of new technology to do that. Option two, okay, they might have to go with higher power radios. Higher power radios up in the air uh, talking to a smartphone is, is no big deal because guess what? The smartphone doesn't have to call, talk back to it because it can use the LTE network to coordinate that. It only has to be one way. So that means that the reality of these option three is a lot more likely sooner than later. So this gives you an idea of how a few of these airships above LA can all be tied together, talking to satellites, picking up ground stations, and delivering high speed bandwidth to a customer that doesn't care where it comes from. You hear a lot about solar aircraft. Well, there's also news that Google has canceled one of their solar aircraft projects, and that's because solar airships are a more suitable platform. There is a HAPS room on BRAX. You can get more information. You can find out why this all makes sense, and it's something that you'll be seeing sooner as opposed to later. <clears throat>